Welcome to the Mike Murphy Show. Hey, this is going to be a show where we bring in some of the most talented people that I know personally, and some people I don't, but we won't get to know them. And today is the first guest, is the first episode. It's a brother of mine. This dude is hilarious. If you've never seen him at a show, you don't know what you're missing. Your stomach be hurting after you leave. He's a beast, I'm telling you right now. So I want to introduce my first guest, a brother of mine, Mr. Tony Rock. Appreciate that, bro. Thank my you. My man, bro. my I'm man. Good. How you I'm feeling good. today, I'm good. bro? I'm good. It's a very good day. Blessed to be alive. That's bro. good. I'm glad you could make it. You know, we're about to bed on the right side this one. Hey, I feel man, good. I, you 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 on the right side of the dirt too. So yes, that's a, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's a blessing. Exactly, you know what I mean? Exactly. So when I like to start the show, what I'm gonna do is I like to tell them how I met the the, the oh, guests yeah, I got absolutely, on. Absolutely. So the, the story funny because you didn't remember it, so I brought it back <laughs> up. So what happened was. Uh, the world opened back up after COVID. After COVID, right. I'm in the Laugh Factory for Ruby Tuesdays, the first show. His yeah. is the 7 o'clock, 7.30 show. Right. After that, he's like, yeah, we celebrating Tony Rock's birthday. Y'all want to stay? Wait, it's I, free. Yeah, yeah go, go, go. Okay, so uh, Ruben Paul is my brother. Everybody knows yeah, yeah. Ruben Paul is a comedian. I've known since the day I stepped foot, maybe a week into L.A., uh, and we've been brothers. Blood couldn't make us any closer than we are. And uh, I had told him earlier that day, hey, I'm doing my show after yours. Yeah. I thought... Me telling him that meant he was gonna promote it. I yeah. just thought he knew instinctively to promote my shit after his. Yeah, he just ran through his whole show, didn't say nothing about my show. Cause I ain't know about it. Right, I was at right. the show. He so didn't now say people shit about outside it. ready for my show. And I'm like, Rube, can you tell them in your room in your show to stay as well? I want to. I want a packed house. Yeah, but you have it. So last minute he realized, oh, I should maybe promote Tone's show as well. So. Yo, and when he said it, now it makes sense because people was like starting to walk out, right, like clear right. the tables. Then they stopped like, oh, free show. Yeah. He's like, yeah. you ain't got to pay or nothing. You, like right. you already, and if you already bought a drink, like the two, they it didn't counts, apply yeah. for the second right. one. Right. I just want, I just want all the asses in the seats. Yeah. When I, when I perform, I don't care how you got in the room. If you bought a $5 ticket or you paid, you know, full fare. Making or people laugh. Date, is it with the, just be in the room because what I do is priceless. Yeah, exactly. So that happens. I'm like, oh, I'm staying. Now, now, I, now for people don't know, I moved out here two months before COVID. So I'm hitting mics, I'm meeting people, and then the world shut down. I didn't know nobody. Right. So now I'm trying to get, and the clubs don't know me, so I'm paying to get in these shows. Right. They ain't just let me in because I'm a comic. They don't know me. So I'm in like, oh, I'm definitely staying for this. I see every all the comics that I see social media piling in. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm staying by the bathroom, whatever. Fast forward the show going on. You had a couple drinks. You getting off stage from bringing up the next comedian. I had more than a couple drinks. You yeah. Keep it, okay. Let's keep it real. I was okay. Fucked you, up. you was bent. You was, <laughs> you was, was bent. <laughs> yeah, so so you was fucked up. So. As you're walking past me, I hear you like, hey, yo, nah, I can't see you talking to because it's there around the corner. Right, you're right. like, I want my chocolate cake. Y'all ain't had my shit last year. Don't play with me. I want my cake and walk past me. And, and, and me, I'm the type of person that I believe if if I'm comfortable enough asking a person for a favor, no matter how big or small, right. I should be comfortable enough doing something to help them without being right. asked or nothing. It's like, right. yo, you, you felt comfortable enough asking me for stage time, right. but you couldn't do this. So I don't like that. So I was like, yo. Should I go get this nigga some chocolate cake? Because <laughs> <laughs> you got to think, I'm like, yo, this could go. He don't know me from a can right, of paint. Right. This could go, yo, nigga, you bought me cake? What's wrong with right, you? Right. Or it could be, oh, that's love. I was like, man, this is just a risk. I'd rather him think I'm weird right, right. than not do it at all. So I drive down Sunset, go to the Ralphs by Boston Nova. I get, they only had little ones. Right. I bought two chocolate cakes. When I come back in, now you coming back off stage again. Because it been about that amount of time. I'm like, yo, here go the cakes, man. I'm a comedian. I ain't know. He was like, oh. My sister told you to get these. I was like, nah. He's like, oh, okay, fam. I was like, he's hit. I was That's like, That's who I was cool. talking to. Yeah, I was yeah. talking to my sister. Yeah, and I ain't know. I was like, yeah. uh, no, nah, I just went and got him. I heard you say something. He's like, oh, good look. Went upstairs. I'm like, all right, cool. I was like, it didn't go bad. It's, you know, whatever. Right, right. So fast forward, it was probably like two months later. A month later, I see you at uh, Ruby Tuesdays again. Right. But you I'm doing, there every Tuesday. Yeah, but you're doing the, the second show now. Right. Not, you know, I don't want Ruben's show. I see you eating. I don't want to interrupt. But I had seen you did an inter a interview with Finesse. At the time, I didn't know who it was. Like, I couldn't remember the interview, but I remember right. you telling a story about why, like, how you left your job. And I was like, I got to ask him oh, about yeah, this yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. So after I was like, I introduced myself and you was like, yo, you look familiar. And I was like, yo, I bought you cake on your birthday. <laughs> on your birthday. <laughs> and he was like, yo, that was you. Oh, shit was good. He was like, yo, what you, you know, what you doing tomorrow? You had a show with Damon Wayans at Supernova. Right, right, right. right. I was like, I don't do nothing. I just come to the comedy clubs every night. He was like, every night? I'm like, yeah, every night. He was like, wow. I'm like, maybe they'll, somebody won't show up. They'll put right, me on right. something. I just come every night. He was like, yo, I only know one other person that ever did that. I'm like, who? you like, me. I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, he was like, yeah, yeah, that's what I did when I moved out. Every day, three shows. They don't do three shows now. They, they used to do 8, 10, and 12. And I would, not only would I stay for all three shows, I would walk. I was staying, my manager at the time, his assistant lived on Pico. Just so if you're from L.A., you can put a pers perspective on the distance. 
My manager at the time had an assistant that lives on Pico and Stanley. That's about three blocks from Fairfax. From from no from uh uh Roscoe's on the uh, yeah, yeah. Going that way. Yeah, yeah. So you pass Fairfax and keep going, what is that? East or west, I'm yeah. not sure. But three blocks from Roscoe's on La Brea. Yeah. So I would walk from Pico and Stanley to Fairfax and and Pico. All the, all way, up. the way up Fairfax to Sunset and Fairfax. Make the left and walk the two blocks to the Laugh Factory every day. And, for, I, and I would sit it. through the 8 o'clock show, the 10 o'clock show, and the 12 o'clock show. And for y'all that doesn't know, I looked it up. It's three and a half miles. I would walk three and a half miles. So I would walk 6.2 miles. Yeah. Three, three, three and a half. Three and a half. Seven, oh, miles. seven miles. Seven I would walk miles. seven miles every day. Every day. To the Laugh Factory and back. So when you told me that, I was like, if I'm tired, I got a car. There's no excuse not to go. He was right. walking seven miles a day Every for day. this with no guarantee to get on stage. Right. So I told you a story. He was like, yo, take my number down. I'm like, all right. Now, I didn't I didn't met Hollywood dudes. He was like, yo, call me tomorrow. Meet me there. You're going to come in with me. I'm going to show you around or do something. I'm yeah. like, all right. I'm like, watch, watch me get to the door. <laughs> and then nigga don't answer the phone. And right. they're like, yo, get the fuck out of here. You know what I'm saying? So I'm waiting. You ain't you ain't pick up right away. I was like, I knew it. I'm about to turn around. Dude's like, who you waiting for? I was like, I'm waiting for Tony Rock. He's like, oh no, no. If you with Tony, I can't have you waiting out here. See? See? He, See? If he finds out I had any of his people just standing around, nah, come on in. I'll let him know you're here. I was like, yeah, okay. And then we hung out, met Damon Wayans, and you killed that show. And yeah. He brought no, you Damon up too. Damon was unbelievable that night. And, Damon was. And you had to follow him. Though. I had to follow him. Yeah. But the, the introduction he gave you. Tell him the introduction intro. they gave you. Damn, it was something like. Uh, Something along the lines of like I've had the pleasure of watching this young man grow up. Yeah, I see that. That's the something premise. Like that, yeah, right? yeah. And then it was like uh, he's he's he holds his own. He's his own man. Yeah, yeah. Like he said everything right in an introduction of somebody that's following a sibling. It was the it flowers. Was like he's his own man. He put the work in. He did it himself. He said everything that was complimentary, and he doesn't know to this day. David Damon might not even know how big of a fan of his I am. Yeah. So just the fact that I was following him was enough for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's but crazy. But then the intro was like, damn, man, he really said like the, the most poignant stuff about my journey. Make you your flowers. Yeah, and, yeah, and he and, absolutely did. And, and and so for y'all don't know, his brother's Chris Rock. Some people don't. They, yeah, yeah. Some people don't even know that. But, yeah. um, and I was going to get to that later, but basically it's like, do you think that your career has been harder or easier having uh, that him as a brother, not like using him, but just you right. following that name? No, it's a little bit of both. It's 50-50. That's a uh easier in some aspects because you really if you're in the industry like if you a, if you a name or if yeah. you're trying to be a name you really don't want to run the risk of being a dick to me yeah oh yeah, yeah. you know what i mean you don't want to run the risk of like i shit it on tone for some bullshit especially yeah when he's tied to this guy yeah but then it's also like well you his brother you should be this funny this much money this much cachet this much done in the business so the accolades the uh, ex expectation gets lofty yeah it's a little bit bigger but then people kind of keep it within they keep it more respectful like, because of the ties to him. It's like playing football. You are Manning. They like right, right, right. Eli Payton, you Archie. Be to, you know, you should be able to do something. Yeah, you, know you ain't that. So that's yeah. that's why I was kind of yeah. wondering. I know you said you try to never and unless it's up, necessary. Manning, yeah. To to use your brother, like I I never use it unless right. it's like something like yo they ain't letting us look, in. No, I'm Chris is my brother. brother. Yeah. I use that shit <laughs> like a nigga uses it. Yeah. I go to fucking. A party, and I'm like, yo, my brother said meet him here. He's inside. And they're like, oh, shit, work? And I get in. No, like, but I'm talking about to get, here, to so. get anything in it, like, credit-wise, like a, a right. role or... No, but I'm saying how... Oh, look, yeah. I, oh, I yeah. use it for simple shit. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. A restaurant, they're like, no reservations. Yo, my brother said meet him here. He's in the back. Like, oh, really? Go ahead. I walk in like... Yeah, that's, in. That's, yeah that's dope. That's how I use it, but... So, you from Bed-Stuy, right? Bed-Stuy. Bed Bed-Stuy, yeah. So, you, what, seven brothers, two sisters? Seven I brothers, right? two sisters. I look, like seven brothers, two sisters, but I count siblings that my mother raised, she didn't give birth to. Yeah. So when you ask Jordan, he'll say I'm one of seven. You ask Chris, he'll say I'm one of six. You ask Andre, he'll say, I count the kids that my mother raised as well, that she brought in. Yeah, yeah, and I, I heard you talk about them before. Yeah, so Maybe on a stoop, they she right, won't feed them. Y'all yeah, get in my, here and my eat brother. Yeah, stuff my like brother. that. Yeah, yeah so for sure. I say one of 10, yeah. And you close with your cousin. Yes, yeah, yeah, Sherrod. 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 That's like, that's my bro. That's like, yeah, yeah, so. We started comedy same exact day. Okay, so now nah, that's what I was gonna get to. At what moment did you know, this is what I want to do? All right, so uh, I was always attracted to stand-up comedy. Okay, so here's the whole story. Uh, it's two. It's like two or three stories that that kind of interject. Yeah. So growing up, my father's the oldest of fifteen children. <sighs> my father is the oldest of fifteen. Yeah. All of my uncles, all of my aunts on my father's side are super funny. 
Hilarious. Just like, just conversational. Just sitting down with a cigarette in his mouth. Like, nigga, I told you, motherfucker, don't fuck him to my nigga. Like, just a story. You would yeah, be, like lunch table funny. You, just... you would be crying, laughing, pee your pants laughing. Yeah. So I remember my father always being family oriented. My father was like this. My father was like, whenever it's one of his children's birthday, and when he one of his, any one of his seeds, yeah. he would command <laughs> all of his brothers and sisters to be at the house for his child's birthday. Pulling rank on it. <laughs> my, yeah, my father was like, yo, I'm big bro. It's my son's birthday or my daughter's birthday. I want all of y'all at the house. Everybody. I don't want no excuses. Everybody has to be at the house for my child's birthday. Yeah. So all of my uncles, all my aunts, and all of their children, all my cousins, yeah. would be at the house for all of our birthdays. So that's that's why my birthdays are so big to me. That's why birthdays have always been a big yeah, thing yeah. to me. That's why even a stranger, if I hear a stranger say, Yo, today's my birthday. I'm like, yo, fam, it's your birthday. What you doing? Like, you're not going out. You're not partying. Yeah, yeah. I'll be like, yo, let me put something in your hand. Or I see, I see you do that on stage when people at shows. That's how big birthdays are to me. Yeah, my father did that to me. So, I say that to say every birthday, all of my siblings, my whole family on the rock side, would be at the house, and my uncles would be telling stories about how they grew up in South Carolina and they moved to New York and they moved to Harlem when they first came to New York and how crazy it was, and we would just sit there and laugh. For hours. Yeah. And I just remember, I remember it vividly. I swear I'm not kidding to you. I remember watching my uncles tell stories and just looking around at like how captivated everybody was. Like home court, pretty much. Like my cousins, my uncles, my aunts, just like by just one guy standing up telling the story. And I just thought, like, that wow, that's really cool to be able to do that. Yeah. Like that's really cool to stand here. And have everybody pay attention to you. And, and Chris wasn't even no, going to we were kids. We were kids, young. We were babies. Yeah, okay. we were babies. We were, I just we want them to know we were, we the timeline even, is. No, we weren't is, even teen. We were nine and middle five, school. four. Yeah. You know oh, even younger. Yeah. So I just remember like, wow, that's that's fucking cool. Okay. Now progression, years come later, and my parents have a record collection and they would listen to Richard Pryor and Dick Gregory and Red Fox and George Carlin and the, and we would just be like, what, what is this they doing? Like in the living room, they would have, you know, have their friends over for a drink and yeah. just throw a record on it. We like, damn, what is that? But it was still that thing that I saw my uncle doing. Yeah. That thing, whatever. But I didn't know what not, that thing was. You're not was. visualizing it, you're just right. hearing it. It's just a guy talking and people laughing. And I'm like, that's like the thing Uncle Harold was doing or Uncle Ronald was doing, you know? Yeah. Then progress again. And now it's Chris is older and it's the comedy bug. It's Eddie Murphy. It's, uh, it's uh, Damon Wayans. It's uh, uh, Sam. Sam. Uh, Sam. What's my man's name? Uh, Sam Kennison. Sam Kennison. It's uh, it's George Carlin. It's Bill Cosby. It's my brother's like listening to this stuff, and I'm like, "What's this? Oh, that's the thing that Uncle Harold and Uncle Ronald was and doing." They kind of transcended it to right. You know what it? Not what it is now, but more what it is now than what you saw right, on right, the record. Right. Plus, it was uh. At first, it was just, I thought it was something that my family did. Yeah. My, my family does this thing. And now it's like, oh, people people do this. Yeah. And then my brother started, you know, his foray into stand-up comedy. How much, how, how much older is he than, from Eight you? years. Uh, okay, so he had a big, yeah, a big so, head start. So uh, he's doing stand-up. He's doing open mics and bringer shows. He's barking. He's doing the lowest level. Tell, tell them what barking is, because a lot of people barking don't know what that means. Barking is when you stand outside of a comedy club and try to solicit an audience. So in New York, barking is a rite of passage. Barking is you have to bark before you can do bringer shows. Bringer shows is you bring five people, you get five minutes. You bring three people, you get three minutes. Uh, but before any of that is barking, is you stand outside the comedy club and you go, hey, comedy show starting in 10 minutes. Hey, my man, you and your girlfriend, you want to come? Come on, I'll give you a drink special. I'll give you a drink ticket. I'll give you one free drink ticket. Whatever you can to get them in. Yeah. If you got drink tickets, you go, yo, I'll give you all two free drink tickets, but you got to pay to get in. All right, oh, two free drinks, man, let's do it. You know, your girl walking down past the comedy club, you're like, hey, babe, something to yeah. do. You know, so in New York, you can do that because there's so much foot traffic. Yeah, for so a lot of foot traffic. You have to do that. Yeah. And you bark. If you get 10 people to pay it to come in, the comedy club owner or manager is going to go, you got 10 people in, we're going to put you up. So you have to really hustle for your stage time. Yeah, you got to work for it. Right. So he's doing that. So he's doing that. And then he would always come home and tell me about his night. Yeah. Man, I saw so-and-so, and this guy came in in New York City. A name is going to walk into a comedy club. Oh, yeah. Every night a name. So I was like, yo, Sam Kinison came in last night. We like, get out of here. You didn't see no Sam Kinison. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, he was at the club last night. Then one night, yo, Eddie Murphy was there last night. Get the fuck out of here. You didn't meet no Eddie Murphy. I'm telling you, I met Eddie Murphy. And he would always say, Tone, I'm telling you, you should be doing this. You should be doing this. But I'm fifth grade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Young. I'm like, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I didn't know anything about written material. I yeah. just knew I was funny to my siblings. Yeah. I was funny on the stoop with my boys. I didn't know about 
you know, the time invested in creating, uh, you know, stand up material, yeah. material. So I was like, eh, hey, whatever. You know, I'm I'm just hearing about your stories. I'm enjoying your stories. And then uh, years and years go by, and uh, he comes home one night. And this is more so my brother's story than my story, but he comes home one night and he wakes us all up and he's like, I was at the comic strip last night and Eddie Murphy walked in and I asked the manager to introduce me to Eddie Murphy and he introduced me and Eddie said, Eddie said, are you on the show tonight? And he wasn't, he wasn't on the show that night. He's like, nah, I'm just hanging out trying to get a spot. And Eddie told the manager, yo, put the kid up. And you can't say no to Eddie Murphy. Oh, hell so not. the manager goes, Chris, you're next. And he goes up and does five minutes. And in his story, when he tells his story, yeah. I'm taking from his story. If you ask him his story, he'll tell you that night, that five minute set, was the best set he ever had in his life. So I don't know if he still says it to this day, yeah. but 10 years ago when he would do the interview, it was like, yo, that's the best set I ever had in my life. And that night, Eddie said, hey, I'm filming this movie. It's called Beverly Hills Cop 2. I'm going to put you in it. And of course, like you said, we all take that, yeah, right, whatever. Yeah. But Eddie called his the club and you know called his management and said, hey, I got a part for Chris and flew him to LA and he was in Beverly Hills Cop 2. And we thought, oh, he's out of here. We thought rich. We thought we rich. <laughs> we moving. We leaving bed style. We're going to get cars and Chicks and all, that, but it was like it was a little bit of a, hundred, a couple hundred dollars. But he was in the business as yeah. far as we were, as far as we were concerned. At that point, he was in the business. But you know, like when he said that's his best set ever, it, that probably was based on his standards at the time. You at know, the and time, then even where moving. he was, but now where he's at now is probably like right. But where he was, yeah, that was crazy. The impact it had, yeah, it was probably the best. Set yeah, ever. right. So okay, that's dope. So now fast forward to get back to my story. So my brother's doing stand up, and uh, he's always like telling you super funny, and I would write little. Things I thought were funny down. I wasn't writing material. I was just writing things I thought were funny. Like, yeah. I'm in school. I'm in high school. And I'm sitting by the window. I'm not paying attention to the teacher. I'm just out the window. like Just bullet points. I just want to get outside, man. I just want to be outside. And I would just write shit like, oh, that's pretty funny. Like, you know, white boys do this and women do this and yeah. booger jokes and shit jokes. I was, <laughs> I was a kid, you know. And then I would, all, then it became a habit of just jotting stuff down. So I had notebooks of just ideas. Yeah. And I hid it under my bed. I never, never showed it to anybody. And then uh, I graduated high school and I was just, I had my little first little bullshit job and at, at work, I would be funny and everybody would be like, yo, Tone's so funny. This thing is so funny. And I would, everybody would always say that. And I'm like, wow, like, maybe there's, there's something to this. Yeah. And I started looking at those notebooks that I had just stuff written in and like, that could be a joke. I guess I could make that a joke. If I had to go on stage, I could say that on stage, right? Not telling anybody. Yeah. Now, by this time, Sherrod is going away to college. Sherrod is in college in Baltimore, Morgan State University. Oh, so before you finish... I heard this. I don't know if it's true. Was there a one point where you were sneaking to watch Chrissy? Oh, no. He would take me. He would take me to comedy. I mean, yes. But your mom was take, and yeah. dad wasn't. No, mom and dad didn't know. Yeah, but, but he, but he say, was taking you. Hey, to... you want to come tonight? And I'm yeah. like, yeah, hell yeah, I want to go. And he would take me to a comedy club. I was sitting in the back in the corner in the darkness. You know how comedy clubs have that little yeah. dark corner. Just sit back there and just watch. Dennis, Dennis Wolfberg, uh, Joe Bolster. Uh, just names that I remember, like guys that I thought were like incredibly super duper funny. They they didn't blow up, but to me, they were super famous. Yeah. And I would come home and just like, man, that was unbelievable. Like, I got to get back in there. Yeah. And then, you know, my brother saw us touring, but I couldn't I couldn't go on tour. I had to go to school. But I just remember just being amongst that and being energized by that and like thinking like, I, this is something I, I want to be a part of. So were you doing comedy? I know you said uh, before I heard an interview, your dad passed away and it kind of like, it, it, was, it fucked you up. Yeah. Because that was like the rocket. You know what I mean? Yeah, like you yeah, said, he's yeah. the oldest of 15. Yeah. So not only is he the rock of- He the, fucked up the, a whole generation. Yeah, his like, passing fucked up a whole Like generation. he's the, the top, but not only yeah. your family, but his siblings. Every, yeah. So were you doing comedy before that happened? No, my father never saw me on stage. Okay, so- never saw me on stage. He never saw me do stand-up, never saw me on TV. It's one of the big, like, I can't live it with regrets. You know, you yeah, life happens the way it's supposed to happen. And you don't question the most high, but- it would have been super cool for him to be in the room one night and like, man, he's really up there. Like, yeah, because I don't think you weren't doing it like you were like, oh, I'll do it. I got time. And then he passed. I think it just wasn't on your it wasn't on my, yeah. on the shelf yet. And then yeah. it came later and you're like, oh, this, he I was I was it. super into sports in high school. I thought I would have some type of a career in sports in some capacity. I don't know what that is. Uh, uh, I had some homies in the streets that were doing some stuff and it was like, hey, maybe I can get some money with them. I don't know. You know, so. You know, it's it's Bed Stuy Brooklyn in the in the early nineties. You yeah. know, you don't know what you want to do. You know. Okay, so since I brought this up earlier about the story you telling me about leaving your job, yeah. I want you to tell it because a lot of people didn't see that, but I think it's inspirational. So anybody watching this, listen to this story. It's a uh, because I think it's um, it, I think it's this taking the safety net. 
Because I know once you tell a story, you'll lead into what happened when you got out here right. and taking that risk. Or just... Well, I told another comic. I'll tell you. I'll tell the story. I will tell the story. But I, I told another comic once who had a full-time job that was struggling with the back and forth of comedy and didn't have the time to dedicate to stand-up because of the full-time job and really wanted to be a part of this, this fraternity that we're in, yeah. but didn't want to take the chance. And I said, hey, man, Superman didn't know he could fly until he jumped out that fucking window. Yeah. So I told him that, and he was like, to this day, when I see him, I might see him at the store or see him at the improv, and he'll be like, damn, man, I remember you told me that shit, like, and I'm out here now, and I'm really doing this. Okay. So my story was, I was working for AIG. AIG was the, it, they would say it every day at work, so I was always <laughs> drilled into my head, the third largest insurance company in the world. It's the third largest, the third largest insurance company, the third largest. They would say that shit every day. Every day at work, we would hear somebody say that. It's the third largest insurance company. I didn't give a fuck. It didn't mean nothing to me. Yeah, like, and, and we're not number one, so why y'all bragging about number three? Yeah. So I, I never, I always was like, why do they keep bragging about three? Yeah. Who the fuck wants to be three? You know what I'm saying? But that's what we would hear at work all the time. And, uh, the department I worked in was a 24-hour department. It was data processing. It was an 8 to 4 shift, a 4 to 12 shift, and a 12 to 8 shift. Yeah. Uh, because we had to do business with London when they woke up. We had to do business with Tokyo when they woke up and Australia when they woke up. So somebody had to always be in the department I worked in. There was always somebody there. Yeah. And uh, at this particular time, I had started doing stand-up. I was doing barking, open mics, you know, bringer shows. And, uh, you know... When you start out, that's when stand up is. That's when stage time is the most important. Oh, yeah, the most. When you first start out, right? You're like, if I could get up one day out the week, you're like, I gotta be there that one day. It might be the funnest too. When it, no, it's all. I will get to that too. All right. So, if if there's seven days in a week and they go, hey, you can go up Monday and Wednesday. Monday and Wednesday are the most important days of the week in my life. Facts. So I have to be there. Whatever else is going on in my life does not compare to Monday and Wednesday. Yeah. I'm getting on stage. So I worked a 4 to 12 shift, 4 p.m. to 12 midnight. That's killer. My me. spot time is 9.15 here and 9.45 here or 10.15 here. I can't be in two places at one time. So one, some of my homies that worked at the job, I would go, hey, man, I need a favor. I need a big favor, bro. I need you to come in at 8.30 so I can leave to make this spot. And some of my dudes that worked with me were like, oh, I got you, bro. Like, And I'm talking about no money involved. I could return the favor. However, if you need me to wash your car or something, I yeah. come in early for you and cover for you while you leave and go on a date. Whatever. Like you just bartering time. I had at that nothing point. really substantial to give you other than the fact that you trusted in your homeboy that I got something important going on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of shout out to my man Jason James, to my brother to this day, would be like, yo, I got you. And he would come in and cover my shift and I would go and do my spots, mm -hmm. not get paid, just you know, trying to get into that next level of getting paid spots. Yeah. So Jay would come in all the time and cover my shift. And then my boss somehow got to him that, you know, Tony's not coming in. He's leaving and working three hours and leaving. And and he called me into his office one day and, uh, you know, he's the boss. So bosses talk disrespectfully to employees. Yeah, just violate. That's what they do. Just, they don't believe in a dream. No. And look, in reality. Because his dream is messing up what he's doing. Right. But in reality, he's stuck in a cubicle. Facts. So that's probably not his dream either. Nope. So if he didn't get to live his life. He the last you. thing you want to see is a motherfucker live his. Yeah, he hating. No, he like, yo, nah, this should be the priority because this is my priority, unfortunately. Yeah. So, unfortunately, this should be your priority. Yep. So, he calls me in the office like, are you making enough money chasing this stupid dream? Stupid dream was the thing that hit me. Are you making enough money chasing this stupid dream that you don't need to work here? And I kept it 100. I was like, no, I'm not, to be honest with you. But if I don't take the chance, then I never will make enough money to not work here. Yeah. And he's like, well, this job puts food in your on your tape on your plate and puts food in your mouth. And he made it seem like he was like, it kind of sounded condescending, condescending, and it sounded slave masterish. No, oh, that's not like it. I'm feeding you. Yeah. Even though he was a worker, just like I was. Now, listen, when I look boy. Back in perspective. Listen, boy. Right, in perspective, it's like, yo, you was a worker too, bro. You wasn't the top dog. You yeah. was You was my boss, but you had bosses over you. Yeah. So. Uh, are you making enough money chasing this stupid dream? I said, no, but if I don't take a chance, I never will. Well, this job feeds you and puts food in your mouth, so this job should get more consideration. Which, and if people are watching and they're looking at it, like, yes, the job I had at the time should be the most important thing. But the dream is bigger than the job, I think. Yeah, for sure. So, But only I'm, only people with a dream understand no, that's that. No, that's why I looked in the camera and I yeah. said that, because only the dreamers are going to understand. The people with jobs... Those, the, the people that dream, and they're, you're going to hear this and be like... But that's yeah. the thing. When I'm telling my story, I'm not ever talking to the people that don't get it. I'm talking to the people that get it. Yeah, for sure. You know I'm saying? Well, even that's why I think that's why I wanted you to tell them because I'm like, this When is I'm important. doing stand-up, I'm not talking to the people that don't get it. I'm talking to the people that get it. Exactly. 
So I went to my cubicle. I sat there for a second. And I, he said, he said uh, you know, take five minutes and take 10 minutes and think about what you want to do. And it didn't even take a minute, two minutes. <laughs> I sat there for a second. I'm like, why am I even sitting? Why the fuck am I even? Why did I even come to the cubicle? Like I walked back in like, hey, man, Friday will be my last day. And I remember it vividly because it was April 14th, Wednesday, April 14th. Because my brother, I have an older brother and a younger brother yeah. who are both born on April 16th. Oh, for real. I got a big brother and a little brother, both both born on April 16th. So Friday, April 16th was my last day. I remember because it was their birthday. And I walked in. I walked into work that day. I worked like nothing was going on. I didn't lead on to the fact I was leaving. Yeah. Sat at my cubicle, worked all day and, you know, made my phone calls. And, hey, this is Anthony from Data Processing. How can I help you? Did everything I was supposed to do. And about five minutes left in my shift, I started just taking pictures down and throwing shit in the garbage and calendar hey you want this calendar and hey you, here's my bathroom pass and that's everything yeah I walked out the job and the job i walked worked on at the time was on uh water street if you know manhattan water street behind it is the water is the uh, east river so the street that we were on leads out to a street that comes like this it's a street this way and then water street goes left and right it doesn't yeah. go into the water so i'm walking to the train station and i just say to myself if you look back at the building you're going to end up back in the building I don't know why I said that. I was just like, on well, some biblical shit, like, you know. And that's what stuck with me. And I kept the walking, story. and I never even looked back at the building. I didn't even go back to get my last check. Like, they probably still owe me some money to this day. <laughs> I just walked straight out the building, straight up the street, straight to the train station, right to the train, right home. And then my boy Jason came in for the next shift and saw my shit going out my yeah, cubicle. Yeah, yeah. I was like, yo, what you doing? I'm like, you know what Abandoned. I did. Abandoned. I said, you know what I did. You know what I, I jumped shit. I'm out. I left. I left. I'm out, and, son. And six months later, I was on a plane to Amsterdam to do a comedy show. And I had never left the country in my life. Yeah, that, that, Six months later, it was, a, it was a group of guys at the, at the comic strip in New York. And I was on stage. It was late night. It was like 11 o'clock. And I was I paid regular now. I had worked my way into the club. And they just, like five guys in the back of the club just watching everybody. And I go, hey, what are you guys doing? You've been here all night. And they're like, we're looking for talent for a TV show. And I'm like, well, you're looking for talent? Well, talent's right here. What are we doing? <laughs> and like, we do a show in, in Amsterdam and, and Rotterdam. It's like the... European version of Def Jam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're looking for comics. And he's like, we love you. We're going to call your manager. And my manager owned the club. Yeah. So I was like, well, call him tomorrow and talk to him. And my manager called me the next day like, hey, you want to do this gig in Amsterdam? And I'm like, fuck yeah. And I was on a plane with like Godfrey and Teddy Smith and Tony Woods and like name comics. Corey was with you too. Corey Holcomb. Corey Holcomb. Guys I really knew. And me. Yeah. And I'm just looking around the plane like, holy shit. Like, we really going to Amsterdam. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. Like the drink, I don't even know why. You know, it's crazy. It's like some shit happens that that's always like, you know, God is always talking to you. Like sending messages. It signs. I, or... I woke up today and just threw this on. Yeah. And just was like, I'm going. To, I had to go meet Jamie early today. Yeah. So I was running late. I was threw a hoodie on. And now that I said that, I'm looking at this like, yo, how crazy is it that I have this on? I did not plan this at all. No. Nah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I know you. I, it's just like I just wow. That's crazy. That's good. So I, I mean. I was going to say, is there, was there a point where you knew like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing? Like, cause sometimes you do this shit and you like, I like doing it. But then that's a moment where you'd be like, oh, this is, this is the universe telling me I got to be doing it. Like I quit with no black, no, no backup plan. And then yeah. I'm right on a plane to do what I love. That had to be the moment that was like, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I, I uh, your, you know, your whole career is a, is, is a bunch of those. Your whole career. If you look back at your whole career, it's a bunch of those like, damn, that was a special moment. You know yeah. What I mean? All the good stuff, I tell people all the time, I think I might have told you this before. A lot of good stuff that has happened to me in my career has just happened from me staying on stage. Yeah, you did tell me that. I got all of us because I was at the Laugh Factory one night. I mean, I was going to ask this, you about this, that too. This so played I'm, a part I'm not saying this is the only reason why I got it. I, I, I did clearly win the audition, but yeah. I got the opportunity. Let's say that. I got the opportunity because I was on stage one night at the Laugh Factory. And I came off stage and Chris Spencer was there. And Chris Spencer walked up to me and said, hey, do you know Monica Swan? Never heard of her. He's like, She's a casting director. She's in the room. She wants to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. And this was, I wasn't living in LA at the time. I was still living in New York. Oh, okay. Coming out for a month, going back. Yeah. Coming out for two weeks, going back. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I go meet Monica Swan and she goes, hey, are you auditioning for anything right now? Are you going up for parts? And I'm like, yeah, I'm here for pilot season. I'm just, you know, whatever parts I can get. And she said, you know, Will Smith is executive producing this TV show that I think you are perfect for the part. And I'm like, well, you know, can you can I get the sides or whatever? And she was like, who do I send it to? And she sent it to the Laugh Factory yeah. because I didn't have an email, didn't have facts. And I was out here. This just, is way back then. I was, so. way, I was, yeah, it was way back, but I didn't have any connection to anybody. Yeah. So like, can you send it to the club and I'll get it from them? And I walked my ass from Pico all the way up Fairfax Three to the factory, got the, fucking, <laughs> got the facts, went 
And it was the, the thing was the audition was like, that shit might've been a week away. Right. Yeah. It might've been like eight, nine days away, which is a lot of time. I don't know why it took that long. So what I did was like, fuck it. I'm gonna go home. And I flew back home to work with my acting teacher. Mon- uh, 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 what's her name? Uh, not Monica Swan. Uh, damn. Why am I forgetting her name? The greatest acting teacher in the world. I flew home to work with her and she got the sides and said, looked at it and said, wow, this is you. Yeah. This character is you. And, you know, let's, let's work on it. And we worked for like a couple of hours and she said, you know what? Let's not overdo it. You got it. You good. Cause I was like, let's do another hour. And she's like, no, 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 let's not. You overkill. It'll be yeah, overkill. You, you, be you got it. Over you go, just go. Too just much. Go, go be great. And I went back to LA, went and auditioned. Boom. And that's, so that's crazy. Cause I was going to ask you how that came about or whatever. And then, you know, it kind of comes full circle as when a situation happened, like almost a year ago with your brother right. and Will, right. You guys had a relationship and so much so that when he did his apology on Instagram, he apologized to you by name. That's the thing. And your mother, like, but he said like, you got a, a bunch of brothers, you got yeah. Jordan, everything. He specifically named you. And I wonder like, I knew this situation when it happens. Cause I got brothers, I got sisters. Right. You, you like, yo, I don't fuck what you did for me. Right. That's family. But right. after the dive down, it was like, how does it feel now? Especially after he, you know, he did the right thing and, and apologized without being forced. Well, you know he did, I, mean? I think he, he was did, genuinely. Well, he did what seemed like the right thing. Yeah, yeah, that could be it too. He did what seemed like the right thing. My phone number ain't never changed. Uh, my phone number ain't never changed. I still had the same phone number from when I was, you know, living on the block. I still have the same exact. If you have my phone number when I worked at AIG, you still have my phone number. So, so let me ask you this, because you said that. Is, that's more personal calling you, but you know how they say it's like the disrespect, the apology got to be as loud as the disrespect. Nah, exactly. Him, him saying it no, for the whole say, world what, to what, see. You know what they say? What's the full saying? You know what the full saying is? Is the, I want to, the, the apology got to be as yes. loud as disrespect or you just a dickhead. <laughs> that's what we say. If the apology is not as loud as the disrespect, then you a dickhead. So that's what I'm getting to. So for you, it'd been louder if he called you personally opposed to telling his hundred million fans or whatever he got on, on social media. Oh, I mean, listen, see that camera right there? Yeah. That camera ain't personal. Yeah. That's not personal. Yeah. So I can sit here right now and pour my heart out into that impersonal device right there. Yeah. It ain't talking to you directly. Yeah, I get that. It's, I'm going to sit in front of this thing and go, hey, man, I really want to say, I really want to just say that I'm, this thing don't give a fuck. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I only I only asked that because like if... And I want to say, look, since you brought it up, because I, I haven't been talking about it a lot because the dummies that don't know any better... Yeah. And when, uh, unfortunately, whenever you do something in the social media realm, yeah, there's the people that know, the smart people, and then there's the dummies that don't have any fucking clue what they're talking about. Yeah. And I've had to encounter way more dummies That's how after is. this shit because everybody's like, oh, this nigga trying to get clout off of that shit. Yo, I've been doing stand-up comedy for 25 years. Yeah, I've, I've been seen in a movies, lot of TV comments, shows. Like- I executive produced TV shows. I've created shows for other people. I wrote shit for other people and handed it to them like, yo, you make the money. I get the executive producer credit. You know what I so didn't like? So how am I trying to get clout off of some dumb shit like this? What, what I didn't like about that was, you know, you you brought me, you, you're the first person that took me on a road, the only person that ever took me on a road to right. do comedy. We went back to my hometown. Pittsburgh, so that was right. bigger than you taking me anywhere else because my people back home was like, oh, like, even though it's like I'm not there yet, they're right. seeing that he's making tr- strides in the right place. Right. So I'm, I'm forever thankful for that. So when we went there, we did shows. One of the dudes that took pictures with you, took pictures with me, everything, is on a shade room comment saying, Tony Rock, who's that? We even know Chris had a brother. And I'm like, see? so I comment, you know, bro, I'm super loyal. And I told you right as after but this see happened. That, but, but that gets more attention. See, if you say that, if that dude who he know, who knows me and spoke to me and took pictures with me and knows you says that on shade room, that gets more traction than, yo, he a cool cat, man. I met him in Pittsburgh. He, he was a real down earth brother. Yeah, that don't get the exactly. traction. So, I, so that's I, the dickheads that I, I'm talking I, about. I could comment right on it. You mean the dude you took pictures with and met when I was performing with that brought me home? To, you talking about him? Yeah, you didn't know him. Oh no, nah, bro, I was just joking. You know what I'm See? saying? Anyone like that? See? I was just being like, nah. You was trying to get fucking attention from broads, See? and you said some corny shit instead of standing up as a man and being like, nah, fuck with dude. He cool. Like, and even if you didn't, here's the thing. Don't say nothing. Then. No, just, listen. <laughs> let's keep this shit. We, we gonna get funky. Even if you didn't know who the fuck I was until my brother got hit. Don't you think a brother should always represent for his fucking well, siblings? That's so... People are like, well, he just doing... Bro, what? I'm like, you either niggas don't have say, no look, siblings or... Niggas say, yo, that's my day one, right? Don't This This is how I know most of these niggas out here. This the, Now we're going to get clear the air. This is how I know most of these niggas is rats and frauds and ops 
and feds and all that shit niggas talk about. Yeah. Because niggas will say all day, yo, I ride for my niggas. I die for my niggas, me and my niggas forever. But I rep for my sibling blood. And they go, oh, you just trying to get clout. That's so crazy, how are you more son. real for repping for a nigga you don't know that you didn't grow up with that has no blood tied to you, but I'm trying to get clout for repping for a nigga that got the same mother and father. That Yeah, that's... Because y'all niggas is all fake and y'all niggas is all rats and y'all niggas is all ops and, and they and just and, and, they, and, and for me personally, I think what it is is that a person like that sees your success, even if it's not like Chris or anybody, everybody got their own path, you know what I'm saying? You're still yeah. super successful no, the, and you're good as fuck at what you do. When they see that, they're like... On hate on this nigga because he's living the life of his dreams. I'm glad you said that. I'm, I'm glad fucking you brought that up. miserable. I'm glad you brought that up. My success makes niggas mad. Oh. My success makes niggas mad. You know why? It makes them uncomfortable too. You know why? Because any nigga that, that puts himself in my shoes, right, would say, man, if I was him, I would just let Chris take care of everything. If I was him, I would just get it, be in Chris's movies and let Chris do, do all the work and I just come and get my. Roger Coates. I'm right. All. Niggas that have no ambition and no no goals and no dreams look at me like, yo, what the fuck is wrong with you that you're not just riding this nigga's coattails? I'm gonna tell you, and, and, and this is so this my is look, real shit. My success angers niggas. Niggas look at like, like, like the Wayne brother, the Wayans brothers. Yeah. They do it the right way. They do yeah. it, they do it the right way. Keenan's the, the head of the snake. He's like, yo, I'm gonna create this thing, and we all gonna. That's how right? nepotism works in every field I, in the whole. I said, yo, you on? My brother was way ahead of me. Yeah. Way ahead of me. Eight years. Yo, you on, bro? Do your thing. I haven't even gotten into the clubs yet. Do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. When it's time for us to work together, we'll work together. But I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to be my own man. But that makes dickheads go, what's wrong with this nigga that he's trying to do it on his own? Yo, That's why they get angered by my presence. Because it's like, yo, if I was you, I wouldn't work for myself. I wouldn't think for myself if I was you. Exactly. And so the, the, the day I met you in the Laugh Factory the second time when I was telling you the story, like, yo, I heard you do this interview, the one you just told right. At the end, I said this to you, and I was like, Joanna I, Bexon, Joanna Bexon, oh, the, acting the greatest coach. acting teacher in the world, Joanna Bexon. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to say that. So when I asked you, and I remember this vividly, I said, I thought it was easy for you to quit the job because you're like, Chris won't let me struggle. Because at this point, he's right. And you was right. like, nah, our dad made us all get our own shit. Like, yeah, I'm not, he's not responsible for me. I'm a grown man. Right. It wasn't like, oh, I quit. Chris got me. Now, when you said that, Dude, I was my like, my father worked oh, two, my father worked two full time jobs. My father worked 80 hours a week. My dad worked. Got off work, came home, took a nap, and went back to work. And when you told me that, I had like a I like I said, I just met you, but I had a level of respect because I come from an era where it's like, nah, get your own, right? Work for it, don't right. do it because you know. Right. What I'm saying now, if it's like I can get you in this movie, but then your talent still got to carry. You ever it. been? You ever been home with your dudes? Like I'm talking about your dudes you grew up with. Yeah. And you got money in your pocket, and he got money in his pocket, and your man got money in his pocket. Ain't it better that way? Way better. Ain't it better that way when y'all all like, nah, nigga, I got it. Yo, I got, yo, get the next one. You know, one. Dame Dad said it. He said, y'all all got bread. You'll be each other's crutches. Won't fall off. You could pick each other up. But it's just one head. They cut the head off the, the dragon. Dude. It's over. Everybody done. Yeah, everybody. Everybody done. Something happened to that man. Everybody fucked. Yeah. Ain't it better? Like, when I'm with my dudes in Brooklyn, and we go, yo, let's go to the grill, my favorite restaurant in the city. And everybody like, yo. I got no son. I got the, I got the we we get the carafe. We get the big carafe for the rum punch. Yeah. Yo, I got the carafe for the rum punch. Yo, I got the uh, shots. Let me get around the shots. Yo, I got the meal. Yo, I got the appetizers. Yo, that's how that's it's way like, better yo, like that. I'm way like, better. Bro, we we might as well be smoking <laughs> cigars up in here because we bosses right now. Yeah, it's it's whack when it's oh he we like yo can we what well we can't let's see what he say like yeah yeah slide you to slide if he go yo y'all eat man go ahead and you oh now we can eat okay that's whack no that's crazy that's whack. I wasn't yeah. raised like that. I was raised to be, yo, we all, we the rock boys. We the rock brothers. Yo, he, 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 let's get it. Yeah, that, and that's, that's dope. So I want to ask you something. What's, the, what that you could talk about? What's the craziest thing, story that ever happened since you've been in this industry? It don't have to be you. It could be something you saw, heard, you know, a part of. This thing, you, you ain't got to say names if you want, but just the wildest shit what, that like, made you be like, yo, dude, this shit is crazy. So many. I don't even know what. Uh, the craziest shit. Uh, uh, me and my brother were fucking the same girl and didn't know it. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, the, the times I had on the set of all of us was fucking crazy. And you did all four seasons? I did four seasons, yeah. Um, but the craziest, dude, there's so much chicks being naked in the green room when I get off stage at the improv. Oh, that's out here? Yeah. Hollywood? Uh, Orlando. Orlando. I was in Orlando. I was 
I'll tell you a few stories. I was in Orlando at the Orlando Improv, the old Orlando Improv. If you remember, if you remember the old Orlando Improv, you remember how it was situated. There was a stage. The stage was here. And then there was a staircase. Like, you know how the, the in the hood they have the outdoor fire escapes? Yeah, yeah. The stage was like that. And then it was like a like a staircase that looked like a fire escape oh, going yeah. up to a door. And that was the green room. Yeah. So when they introduced you, you would open the door, come down the stairs. Well, that's how it is at the Hollywood improv. They got Yeah, the, but the that was, like that, that was right behind you. Yeah. yeah. Right behind oh, you right behind. Stage. Okay, yeah. So I'm on stage, me and my man Butch Bradley, my brother forever. We are at the Orlando Improv, and Butch has just introduced me. I'm on stage. I'm maybe 15, 20 minutes into my set, and some girl yells out, I love you, and I say some sweet stuff back to her. I'm on some, like, fly, fly shit, like, baby girl, you know, you looking so gorgeous. I'm uh, trying to get through my set, but you so fine. Some shit like that. Something yeah. whack, but corny, but it worked for her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she got up and walked out the room. And I was like, you leaving, baby? And she's like, I'll be back. And I was like, well, you know, make sure you say hi when you get back. Something like that. Like, don't, don't forget to say hi when you come back. Like, okay. What I didn't know was she walked around, went upstairs to the green room, knocked on the door. Butch opens the door. And she goes, hey, I want to be in here when Tony comes off stage. He was like, and Butch is like, well, sit down. And she's like, no, I want to be in here when Tony comes off stage. And he, he's in there watching TV, eating, you know, after the show. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, well, have a seat. You could be in here when Tony comes off stage. And she goes, no, I want to be in here naked when Tony comes off stage. Shit. And Butch goes, oh, you want the room to yourself? OK. He grabs his food and shit. <laughs> nah, I'm out. Like, All right, baby, you have a good night and leaves. <laughs> she's sitting there with a dude. Dude gets up, starts looking around the club for her, goes in the, the female bathroom, male bathroom, looking around, going crazy for her. I'm on stage. I have no idea this is going on. Yeah, I have yeah. no idea this is going you on. You ain't paying in attention my set. to that shit. Dude goes, finds his way upstairs, boom, opens the green room door. She's laying on the couch naked. What the fuck are you doing? Get your fucking clothes on. Let's go. Drags out the club. Damn. As he's dragging her out the door, I say, good night, Orlando. I walk up the stairs, open the door. As soon as I open the door, Butch is standing like, bro. If you would have came off stage five minutes earlier, and I'm like, what happened? He that tells me the whole story. Man, I'm like, nigga. get the fuck out of here. I'm like, where's she at? He's like, she, he dragged out the club. <laughs> so I never saw it, but it was a crazy ass story. Okay. Now. I'm on stage one night at the lab factory, right? Now on sunset. Yeah. You know, on stage, the chick yells out, Tony, I love you. I love you so much. I'm like, I love you too, baby. I go into my first joke. I love you. You don't understand how much I love you. I love you too, sweetheart. I'm going into my joke. She goes, no, I got seven piercings I want to show you. And I stop and I go, I look at the room, I go, well, now she has my attention. <laughs> and she sticks her tongue out. That was one. She goes, no, she goes, one, two, three, sticks her tongue out. Lifts her shirt up, shows me her nipples appears. Five, six. Five, what? One, two, three. Four, five. Four, five. Navel, six. six. Puts her foot up on the chair, pulls her skirt up, pulls her clit out, and shows me her clit spears. Whole room like, oh, oh. So now... For the joke to work, welcome you, to Hollywood, for the, gentlemen. For the joke to work, you gotta be cool. You gotta, yeah. you can't be shocked by the, well, whatever happens. Yeah. So I go, that would be seven, and the room just busts out laughing. <laughs> and the wait staff comes, like management comes, like, yo, you gotta put your leg down. You put your... I'm like, no, don't, don't kick her out. Don't kick her out. Yeah, fuck like, that. Do not do that. She and earned all that. The like, get the fuck. That shit never happens to me. That's crazy. Yeah. There's so many crazy stories, bro. It's like, you know, this industry is insane. So you're gonna yeah. have a million crazy. Because I, so this has happened like a couple months ago. We at. I was I didn't even know you were there yet. I was upstairs. It was Ruby Tuesdays. He's doing crowd work. The dude says something like, I'll fuck you up. Oh, and, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. You see all you see me, Jesse. Yeah. We all looking over the railing, like what we start coming down the steps. I see you like taking your jacket off and shit. And and dude's like, nah, I'm, let, let me they about to kick him out. Yeah, yeah. And we like, no, 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 we got it. You know what I'm saying? I was but, like, yo, Rue, Rue, Rue. He's like, no, no, he good, he yeah, good. Yeah, dude was like, yeah, I, I yeah. apologize. Like he was from like Russia, so he said, yeah, I apologize. Yeah, I yeah, that, but I, we I just did. started, you see niggas coming from the back where, 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 where the clock is at, like coming up yes, this way. Yes, me and yes. Jesse come down the steps, Rube on stage, like. Bro, that's how it's supposed to be in comedy. But look, that that right there speaks of bigger volumes of how it's supposed to be in comedy across the board. We should all look out for each other. Yeah, that nobody way. was like, oh, that's crazy. We was like, oh, oh. But I'm talking about what wouldn't it be better if we all looked out for each other that way with opportunities, oh, yeah. with ideas, with you know, with with creating. But a lot of people thing. are afraid that oh, he's shining, I can't shine. That's not the case. That's it's the biggest, that's 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 not the biggest, but that's one of the biggest issues with stand-up comedy is that. Sometimes comics think that when you get something, you took it from them. Yeah. I, everything I have ever gotten in this business was mine. Everything, every TV show I got, every movie, everything I've ever gotten was mine. Like we, you, we seen it when T.I. was doing comedy, right? Yeah. He got, early on, he got booked at the, I think, Microsoft Theater with a bunch of, yeah, like, in comedy, we know a person with that little bit of experience shouldn't be on that stage with them, right? Comedically, no. Comedically, yeah. Right. But his status 
Star power, sure. You're putting him on sure. it, right? But I've seen people hating on him, and I'm like, yo, if it wasn't him, it still wasn't you. Right. So why do you care? He right. didn't take nothing from you. You would just be like, oh, damn. That's the, that's You're the, upset about the like protocol being broke, but he's a superstar. Right. He's an actor. He's a musician. He's super talented. Like, bro, he's going to get shit you should you're not only, getting. You should only be able to, to say something about it if it would have been you. Yeah, like, oh, I, they, they had me and I got bumped. Right. Then you could be mad. Right. If I got a part and you were up for it and I got it, okay, be a little upset. It was it came down to me and you. And you got it because But of, if you wasn't even in the running yeah. and you like, this nigga don't... Bro, you act like it was like yeah. I took it from you. You yeah. act like your bank account is, is going gonna, gonna to be affected by me getting something. Yeah, that's the you worst. Was on, your shit was on low when I got it and it's going to stay on low because you a fucking hater. That's crazy. Be concerned with your own shit. So look, tell, <laughs> if you want, tell the story about when you seen T.I. in Atlanta Y'all was at the strip club. Oh, man. Because oh, no, you told so, him on stage so, so when he was tip, there. And tip, he, is, <laughs> tip is one. I, I have very few. I, it's crazy. I have very, very few celebrity friends. Yeah. I don't have a lot. My friends are my real friends. The cats that I came up with and, you know, cats I'm in the trenches with. And Tip, I consider a friend. Yeah. Tip had signed one of my brothers out of Houston, my man, Trey the Truth. Yeah. Uh, Trey is my, I guess my bro. Tip has signed him to Grand Hustle. So when he signed with Tip, I was around him a lot. So I was around Tip a lot. Tip knew who I was because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Tony Rocks. So yeah. He knew who the fuck I was. And uh, we would hang out a lot in Atlanta. We would hang out in Houston. And one night I'm in Atlanta and it was the grand opening of DOA, Diamonds of Atlanta. Yo, you have never <laughs> seen a strip club in Atlanta <laughs> until you have been at the grand opening of one. Holy shit. And Atlanta. And Atlanta. That's what I'm saying. That's crazy. So we at, we at a... Uh, ain't fucking Oklahoma or no shit. <laughs> right. We had an album listening party earlier that night. I think it was Trey's album that he, the first album he did with Tip. We at the listening party and they're like, yo, after party at Diamonds of Atlanta, it's the grand opening. I'm like, wow, the grand opening. And Tip is like, yo, Rock, you going, you sliding through Rock, Rock, I see you over there. And I got my car, I got my people with me. So yeah. I'm like, yo, I don't need to, they're like, yo, ride with us. I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. Cause I, I try not to impose on people yeah, yeah. To, a, to a certain extent. Just to like, play it cool. Like, I can make I'll it. If there. I could get there, I could get there. I don't need to be in the sprinter van. I could get there too. You know, I got money too. You know, we all good. So I get there before them. They take the, the scenic route and stop and get smoke or whatever. They do their thing. I'm straight there. So I get in with my people. I got two people with me. We got the little table set up. And I'm like, yeah, it's going to be a big night. Like, I'm going to really uh, I'm gonna spend some money I'm tonight. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yo, let me get like a thousand and ones. Let me get a thousand and ones. And the chick comes back with a little stack of a thousand ones. It's not that big. And I'm like, I put it on the table. Like, yeah, we about to really, we about to really have some fun tonight with a thousand ones. Yeah. And Tip come in with the whole entourage. And, and now... When you in Pittsburgh, I say this all the time. When you in Pittsburgh, you sound more like you from Pittsburgh when you in Pittsburgh. Yeah. When I'm in Brooklyn, I don't talk like this. Yeah. When I'm in Brooklyn, it's like dead ass son, yo, facts. What the fuck, yo, yo son, what we doing? Yo, real talk. Yo, come here, yo. Yo, yo, stop playing, yo. You know what I'm saying? This is the Hollywood voice. Yeah, yeah. So Tip is in Atlanta. He walking like, yo, I'm like, let me get 50 of them things, put 50 of them things on the tape right there, pop that bottle right there, oh, put oh, put that nigga girl. And I'm like, what's he saying? And I said, he said, 15 of them things? He said, 15 of them things? He getting fifteen hundred dollars? He getting fifteen thousand dollars? And the chick comes rolling the table out. Fucking cart. <laughs> $50,000. God damn. And she starts stacking that shit. And now he's at the table right next to me. <laughs> so my $1,000 is on my table like that. <laughs> and he has a mound of money. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this. I take my fucking thousand dollars. I put that shit in my back pocket so fast. And tip the is fact just, that it can fit in there is yeah, like humbling right, as fuck. Right. Like, yeah. So look, he's taking the money, and you know he's popping the band and throwing the whole thing, the whole clip. <laughs> and it's so much money just rain, it literally making it rain. Like yeah. this is making it rain for real. Yeah. And it's so much money Green just carpet shit, carpet like just covering the the sky and the lights. You can't see where it's coming from. Yeah. So I'm like, oh fuck that. So the next time he pops a band, he throws that shit. I go like this too, <laughs> empty-handed. I go the Millie Vanilli. And it looks like yo, it looks like Tim and the, the strippers like yo, Tony Rock and Tim are right. balling. Yo, Tony Rock and Tim are going up over there. Them niggas is throwing rocks. I, I'm just going like every time he does, I do this. 
And they six is running up like, oh shit, Tony Rock, you got it like that. I'm like, come on, you know what the fuck it is, yo. You know what it is, you know what we do. You know what time it is, son. And Tim sees him. He sees me doing it. He's just like, yo, Rock, you crazy the motherfucker. Rock, but you, you get a crazy. pass because you're a comedian. I'm a comedian. Like, so nigga, I'm, not, I'm not taking the money. I'm not touching the money. Yeah, it's not yeah. my money. I'm not touching it. I'm not picking it up off the floor. That's corny shit. Yeah. But it's funny. And my boys are dying. They tears. <laughs> my boys are crying. Like, yo, so you wow. And he think you just being a funny nigga like, like you always. Dude. Right. So <laughs> we throw and I and I bought liquor. I paid for liquor. I still had bottles that I paid for but every time he made oh, it rain shit. i just, just go like that and the whole night and then the rest of the week i'm in atlanta and i go to get pizza and it's like how much is it seven dollars one, one two, two three <laughs> four five everywhere i went i bought like a pair of sneakers like some air force ones 120 one two three four five six seven eight, 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 eight. like the I whole rest of the week fuck that yeah That's great dope. night great night great i i highly recommend you party with tip in atlanta if you ever get a chance to. Dude, that shit crazy yeah so he's definitely the mayor of atlanta <laughs> so you're not technically a brand new father but you are with your son's two, right? My son's two and a half, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. brand new in, in the as sense far as of, it, yeah. Yeah, but he's not like, like six to, months or nothing. But I haven't he, had to tell him about white people yet, so it's yeah, still uh, brand new. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had to have that conversation yet. And you named him after where your parents is from? Uh, my, my father's from Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah. And my oldest brother's name is Charles. Oh, okay. passed away. He was my hero. Yeah, he passed, so uh, it's a combination of Charleston and Charles. So okay. I like Charleston. So how does that change your life? Like, oh, dude, it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. You you got a kid. You know, Yeah, because I, I, I see, like I said, I didn't, I didn't know you prior to that. But when I could see how you interact with him on social yeah, media, yeah. and you take him when bro, when, when you took the picture, he's on a stage. I was in Paramus, right? In, no, in we, Jersey? Was in, we was in Chicago. Oh, Chicago! This past weekend, you saw. No, the, the first time you brought him on was, oh, was oh, Jersey. Oh, that was a, Jersey. We did at the, the sports. The, uh, the, the, the uh, pack, pack NJ Pack NJ Pack. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was the Thanksgiving comedy jam, and that was the first time you took him out on stage. Yo, and he's yo. so much. He got to be a rock in the core because he was like kids is usually like oh yeah no no he was out there like yo did you like, see last week in chicago no, i see you i see you on a on the flight yo, but i didn't see week the, in uh, chicago and the green room is right attached to the stage like there's a door right here you on stage yeah so i'm like after the first show i thought he would be sleeping for the second show yeah so i said first show bring him out after the first show i yeah. had jordan with me as well my oh yeah, yeah so i go with jordan when he when i say good night oh yeah like six sold out shows yeah we sold out every show yeah, yeah. so let's just make that clear every show so and rock is selling crazy? shit out that club in Chicago, in Schaumburg, the improv, it seats uh, 400 people. It's a big. It's like 400, maybe 425. Because like when we when I seen the Trey post the, the boomerang, y'all, yeah. we was at the Chocolate Sundays and Corey Hulkman I was like, yo, you from Chicago, what's that hole? He's like, I think like 450 or almost yeah. five something. It, yeah. like, it's, it's a lot. It's a big He's like, it's one of the biggest ones. I, I remember like, when Damn. I used to do it, like let's say five, six years ago when I used to do it, if I had 300 people in there, I would be like, oh, we got a crowd in this motherfucker tonight. Yeah. So the fact that I went back years later and sold out every show, I was like, dude, I'm, yeah, let me tell you something, bro. I, I told Trey and I told Jordan, I was like, yo, listen, I ain't trying to sugarcoat it, man. That's fucking big. We should be proud of that. Fuck yeah. And I'm not, and I, my show is never me. My show is who's ever on it. So I'm like, yo, we should be proud of that shit. Yeah, for sure. But after the first show, I told Jordan, yo, bring Charleston out. Let him say hi to the audience because uh, he'll be sleeping after the second show. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Rock the Mike comedy tour. I'm Tony Rock. That's Jordan Rock. That's Trey Elliott. We always do the intros and yeah. outro, the outro. And I go, and my baby. And Char Jordan walks out with Charleston. And I swear to you, I saw it. Like how I just told my story about how I got bit by the bug. Yeah, and yeah. My parents would, I would watch them tell stories. I saw him touch the mic. And he said, uh, and heard it. it was and like, he smiled. It and he was just like, uh, uh, uh. And I said, say goodnight, everybody. He was like, goodnight, everybody. And I said, say peace. And he was like, peace. And when they were letting the room out, he stayed on stage the whole time. He didn't want to go back in the green room. Oh, that's he wanted it. the mic in his hand the whole time. And I was watching him just talking to the mic and walking around with Uncle Jesse and just looking at him. And I said, holy shit. Like, it just happened. Like, he just got bit. It yeah. just happened that You've fast. You've seen it. That's like a proud moment. And to this day, we in the house to this day. If I go home right now, I go, what does that I do? I say, like, Dada is so funny. You might have to buy like one of them little plastic like Fisher oh, Price microphone get, joints. That's coming for birthday. You got Bur to, you know what I'm a little karaoke machine, all that. Like, dude, I saw it happen, and I said, "Damn, this is how it happens." Like, you just get that that feeling of the connection with the mic and the, the people. And I was like, "Wow, he's he's in." Okay, that's he dope. don't necessarily have to be a comedian, but I saw that it brought him joy to be on stage with. The yeah, mic. I mean, he, he might he might be his own whole. He mm -hmm. might be an accountant and have joy with that right you know what i learned bro like as being a father's my i had nephews that i would be like man y'all gonna play football just on them hard and they would be like they didn't want it you know and i right. was like they want to kind of like mature a little bit i'm like now nah, i want to i just want to encourage them to do whatever they want to do so like when my daughter yeah. she was like i want to be a youtube store and when we was growing up and you're, and you're a little bit older than me right that like yo you want to be a what like that wasn't right something right. that was real and i'd be like yo that's not a real job but that's the thing that's what parents do parents think that their life 
their child, they think their children's life fought. is in the same space as theirs. They don't really realize, yo, we've moved on from that. Yeah, everything way changes. Of we moved on from that, that wanting that job. We moved on from talking like that, interacting with people like that. So if they say they want to do something different, just encourage it. Yeah. Because it might, they might, their mind might change in the next couple of years anyway. But if they, they will remember, they won't remember that they wanted to play piano when they was five. They don't remember they wanted to be a rock star when they was four or seven or right. play basketball. But they will remember my parent didn't encourage me. Yeah, or didn't let me. Didn't want me to. Didn't yeah. let me. So Charleston's going to always say, yo, every time I said I want to do something, dad was like, let's get it. Because I came from that, like, that family where my dad's like, yeah, get a real job. Like, yeah, I've been funny all my that's, life. That's what but they, I didn't even think being a comedian was even a, like, a, when you said, right. I remember you said you saw, you know, you heard Eddie all them, seen him. But you, when Chrissy was doing it, you knew, like, oh, this is. It was tangible. That's tangible. what made it real. That's what made it real because the guy, and I said this, the guy in the next room was doing it. Yeah. Richard Pryor, I had never met. I had never had a conversation with. Uh, George Carlin, I never met. Bill Cosby, I had never met. All of them, like, the guys I really looked up to, I had never met them. But you could they were just him. ideas. They was like, okay, maybe. It's like an ideology. But the nigga in the next room, it was an ideology. The, the guy in the next room made it real. Like, oh shit, he's doing it. Yeah. And we just had the same dinner. Yeah. And we have the same <laughs> parents. And we ride in the same car. And we share clothes. Oh shit, I can do it. And that's why, and I used to regret that for a while because... I started comedy so late. I'm like, I wish I'd have been doing this right. Yeah, I was like blooming too. But but then I said, yo, this that's not my path. My path is I'm right. here now. Right. I might not even be in this situation had I started then. I might not have had right. the life experience, the the fortitude. Oh, dude, I would have been, you know what I'm saying? Like if I, I started comedy at 16, I'd be coked out. I'd be 10 kids in. I'd so be, you know what I mean? So I'd I, be a story y'all tell motherfuckers not to be like. I stop regretting and just be like, let me appreciate everything I get now. Yeah. Because this is the journey I'm on. That's, that's I can't happiness. look at I can't look at what didn't happen. And so now my daughter, I'm like, yo, whatever you want to do, right. I support it because but I know that, I'll Let's not that gloss in. over what you just said. That's happiness. Being comfortable in whatever space you are along the journey. Up, down, in the middle, fucked up, whatever, enjoying that space that you're in. That's happiness. Like people will be like, bro, you still you still talk to Tony? I'll be like, yeah, all the time, bro. Like, it's not just I ain't just meeting one day and I'm like, that's what right. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, and I tell people my friends is back home because it's like I look at you, I'm like, yo, when I met you, I'm like, yo, this motherfucker gave me his number. So I'm like, yo, meet me here. I'm like, I'm bragging in it. Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Da, 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 you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, to me, it was a big deal. And I'm like, yo, this dude, when you had your birthday party last year, I remember you saying this is the this is the calendar for the weekend, right? Right. It was like a close friends and family it was dinner. dinner. Then it, was, it, was, yeah. it was this, it was this. And I was like, all right. So when you sent everything, I got everything. And then you were like, oh, I got to send you for the dinner. And I was like kind of taken back. Like, oh, that's, I thought it was for like your family and close friends. You're like, nah, you you here now. I'm like, oh, shit. And I was with the people that you call family. I'm like, right, right. oh, this is dope. Yeah, everybody you saw there was like, yeah, that and, was. And I met a bunch of uh, yeah. super dope. Yeah, cool dudes at that yeah. thing, and they I fuck with them. They still Instagram. I still talk right. to them, but I'm like, oh, this dude is really considering me to be. I'm like, and that meant a lot to me because you could have just been like, nah, fam, I'll see you at the uh, right, right, you know, right, on Saturday. Right. I'm like, oh, this dude, right. you know, what I'm saying. Then I walked into the day party. He was like, nah, we got to get you something to drink. What, what's up? <laughs> I was like, oh shit. So it meant a lot. It was like, oh, this yeah. is a dope moment. So even at where I'm at right now, when people are like, yo, you came to Hollywood, I sold my house, my business, my motorcycle, everything, just cashed right. out and came here. And now they see me. I got you on my podcast. Right. So I want. I want a, a, a one city but with ain't you. Ain't it better that it's way? Better. It's like yo, now. Imagine if every comic did that. If every comic was like, "Yo, you just moved here, bro. Yo, we going. We do. We shoot pool on right. Saturdays. Come be through. A family and it's like you know what I'm saying. And, Wouldn't it be better it'd be if we way all? better? And when I tell them that, they look at me like, "Bro, being around you just in the 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 proximity makes people like." Yo, that nigga's winning. I'm Let winning on something. my own because I'm accomplishing my goal, but just being tied to people that other people look up to and be like, that dude's a star. Let me say something. I do that because, one, this is going to sound crazy. Ready? <laughs> I'm, genuinely nice. I'm genuinely a nice guy. That's number one. I'm genuinely a nice guy. I just believe in being nice to people, especially comics, because I remember the journey. Yeah. But two, because, like I said, I remember the journey, and I remember... Being the guy in the back of the room, two for two parts, two parts of this. I remember being the guy in the back of the room, wishing I could go on stage, like watching the show, like damn, man, I wish I could. I remember that, right? Yeah. And I remember the guys that were that were uh, helpful in that journey. I remember, I remember going to see DL Hughley at Ontario, right? Yeah. And I walked. In, That's I, like like an hour from yeah. Los Angeles. But I say to tell the story because of how much better it can be. I remember walking in the green room. I was like, I'll go in and say hi. And then I'll go sit down and watch the show. Right. Yeah. And I walk in, I see uh, DL and uh, David Rayborn, I think was his open act at the time. Shout out to David Rayborn. And uh, DL says, all right, so how are we going to do it? We're going to do uh, the host with somebody. I forgot. And he goes, all right, you go up and then bring rock up and then 
uh, David, you go up and then I'll close it out. And I'm like, oh, no, no, I was just coming to say what's up. And DL said, you walked in the club, you want to go up. And we all do. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And I'm like, that's how it's supposed to be. Like, I remember not being able to get up on stage. So I always was like, when I get that position, I'm going to always let motherfuckers get a little time and, yo, do some do five or yo, go up and do some time because I know you want to. Yeah. Secondly, I remember vividly being with my brother and being shit on. I remember people pushing me out the way to get to my brother. Yeah. I remember motherfuckers like, yo, call your call Chris. And I'm like, hey, that's my brother. But like, like oh, you so, oh, you, that's your brother? Well, call you. Like, I remember that. And I remember being like, when I'm in that position, I ain't gonna do the same shit. I ain't shit. gonna do that shit. Yeah. When I meet the big the, the person who's the star, I'm gonna shake the assistant's hand too. Yeah, you gotta treat when I meet the big the, when I meet when I'm next to Eddie, I'm gonna say, hey, what do you do? Okay, cool. Nice to meet you, man. When I'm with Jamie Foxx at Jamie Foxx's house, I'm gonna go. Yo, fam, what do you do? You was you was assistant? Okay, nice to meet you, man. Tony, nice. I'm never gonna shit on the, yeah. the the people in the circle just for the guy in the middle of the circle. Yeah, that's that's why I do that. And and I, I'm appreciative. Like I got an Ontario story that's good too. Like just a couple of weeks ago, um, my man T Robe tours with Gary Owen. I know, y'all know. T-Robe. So, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I seen he was coming to Ontario, and I was like, yo, I'm gonna just come pull up on you. Yeah. The Saturday the late show, like just mm-hmm. to check you out. I got a show Friday in L.A., but I'll come out there Saturday late. He was like. I right, but you want to do time? I'm like, no, nah, I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't saying that right. for that. Like, I just wanted to come support you. you know, you out here. He was like, man, fuck it. You do both both shows. I was like, oh, I right. ain't that better. And then I did it. I I, I did the first one. He's like, yo, you killed that. I was ain't like, that better? yo, this is so dope. So and Gary, he that's like the, that's a the second third second time Gary even gave me time on stage. Oh, Gary's and, dope. Yeah, he's dope he, as fuck. He'd be like, yo, I mean, I go to Arizona a lot. He'd be like, yo, you know, I got you, whatever. So I I hosted one of his shows when he was filming for his last special. And, dope, in Arizona, man. so yeah, I I want. Hey, Ain't Gary that better? Owen, thanks, T. Ain't Rowe, that better? Thanks. It's way better. Ain't that better? Me and Gary be in L.A. or being like on the road somewhere, and he'll say, "This is me and Gary's thing." Uh, this our running joke with each other. I always stay in better hotels than him. Yeah. So whenever we on the tour together, he'll be like, "Nah, fuck that, man. Where you staying?" I'm like, "I'm staying over at the whatever." He's like, "Nah, I'm canceling my shit. I'm staying over there." And then when we meet in the lobby, he's like, "Yo, how you found this shit, man?" He then he say that one, one time that I was doing like an arena or something, and your boy stole his. Uh, <laughs> His vodka out the green room or some shit. And it, he said it was like a hip hop, like he's like just like a hip hop video, and they in there freestyling and shit. And I laugh because I'm like, yo, every time Tone gets drunk at the laugh factory, he wants to start rapping and shit. And we got beats. <laughs> we, we have, yo, we so serious. We're serious with it. We have instrumentals. Yo, we don't even have like play the song. We nah, play the instrumental. The instrumental. They have their free every birthday, both your birthday. Yeah, yeah, yo, uh, hey, hey, put the put the shit on, bro. Yes, niggas up there freestyling and shit. So when he said that, like I went in there like, rapping and so shit, tone. I was like, oh, he definitely we stole the fucking liquor. That particular show, we got there and. And our, my room wasn't set up yet. Yeah. Like we walked in like to nothing. No chips, no fruit platter, <laughs> no liquor. We like, yo, what the fuck? And my boys, my boys from the block. They from the hood. They're like, yo, son, where your, where your stuff at? I'm like, yo, they ain't set my shit up yet. Yo, fuck that. We be back. And they walked and started opening doors. And Quake had a whole setup. And like, nah, we ain't gonna take from Quake. And uh, Gary, oh, what Gary got? Oh, Gary got the same vodka. We drink. Boom. <laughs> came back to the room like, yo, we doing? And then Gary, <laughs> like 20 minutes later, like, yo, did you have this uh on your rider? And I'm like, yeah. Like, well, I had one of my rider. Mine's is gone. Yeah. Like, he leaves like, yo, y'all took his shit. Like, yeah, so he had a couple bottles. We had to get something. Yo, that like, shit, hey, I heard that's funny as hell. Yeah. So, yo, what's your favorite city to perform in? Uh, besides New York, because New York yeah, is no, where I started. So New York is always home. Uh, DC. DC. DC is. The, the improv or just DC Just in anyway. I, I love the improv. The improv is my favorite club when I'm touring and I'm doing clubs. Yeah. That's my favorite club. But anywhere in DC, uh, Constitution Hall, Howard Theater. Improv. Uh, Tom, my man Tommy Taylor has a room that he oh, yeah. does. You know, remember I told you that, that I sent you the screenshot when the girl went to your show. I'm like, she's like, oh, I know somebody used to talk to him, whatever. She's yeah. like, she's like oh, they, I know uh, Tommy because my girl talked to like, We're bro, going. Bro. Yeah. So she hit me like, yo, that was one of the best shows I ever, I ever been to. I was like, yeah, yeah it's dope because I told yeah. her like, yo, go to that. So that's uh, dope when, when somebody will say like, I see, I saw your man said it, something like that, similar. Somebody sent you a text. Like, oh, the uh, one dude was like, when you roasted me at the pink one? Yeah, 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 yeah. I say, yo, because people don't know, you're a king. He had a pink hat on, a pink hoodie. And his girl, too. Pink sweatpants and pink sneakers. And it was his birthday. Yeah, and his girl and had his the girl same had shit. Pink, yeah, same I shit. was like, dude, you got to be in love with her for her to be like, yo, put the pink on it. You said, okay. Yeah, that's my man, Mike, from back home. He yeah. was like, yo, shout funny out, Shout out, Bubbalicious. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to wrap it up. I got to just uh, two more questions. Go so, ahead, do you think? What's... What's the biggest regret that you probably had in your career? If you could go back, you you would you wouldn't do Ooh, it change. Biggest it. regret in my career. Yeah. Uh I did a show, and you know it's crazy. Like, I'll probably be driving home and think of something else and call you, like, oh, that's a regret too. <laughs> but for right now, since I'm in the moment, the biggest regret, and it sounds weird, was that I did a show 
uh, called the Tony Rock Project. Was it like sketches? No. See, uh, initially, I had pitched to my agent. I wanted to do, I wanted to do my version of Chappelle Show. I wanted yeah. to do a very edgy, push the envelope, based on race sketch comedy show. Yeah. And that was what I pitched. And then some producers came on board. The guys that produce Cops, the same oh, production shit. company that does Cops, yeah. wanted to do comedy. And they're like, hey, we want to do something. They're like, well, Tony got an idea. And I met with them. And they were super cool guys. They were super cool guys. They didn't really understand comedy that that well, but they wanted to be in the business of comedy. And I'm like, Pat, let's do it. Let's partner up. And then the network was like, you can't do that. Like, I had some, to submit some ideas. Yeah. Oh, you can't do that. Clipped it you all. You can't submit that. You can't say that. You can't imply that. And... What I ended up with was bits and pieces of a show that I had so such high hopes for. Yeah. So much so that I was like, you know what? I don't want to do it anymore. I was like, I don't want to do it. I'm, I'm out. And then they went to my agency and offered more money. And then they said, we'll, change, we'll, we'll even name the show after you. You could call it the Tony Rock Project. And I'm like, damn, my name on it. And I got more money. And that was the first time in my career that I did something just for the check. Yeah. And, regret and it. it was the project that I liked the least. I def I did not enjoy one day working there. I was like, I'm leaving. And they was like, you can hire, you can hire somebody if you want. You can hire some people. So I hired Rube. I hired, yeah. So Rube was my head writer. And I would come to work every day. Like, I don't want to do this shit, man. Rube was like, yo, well, we getting paid, bro. Let's just get this money. You know, yeah. you know, you don't get these opportunities so often to have your name on the show. And, and I did it for the check. It was the one time in my career I did something just for the check. And I regretted it to this day. So much so that I always say to this day, I'll never do anything ever again just for the money. I don't care what this, how many zeros are on the check. If I don't love it, really want to do it, have a connection to it, I'm not doing it. Okay. I just go on the road. I'll just go on the road and make the money, yeah, the same amount of sure. money. So as a comic, you always have that luxury. Yeah, yeah. I can still make that money on the road. So I don't have to do some, I don't have to play myself. You have to compromise yourself. Right. For and it. I did that with Tony Rock Project and that I regret that to this okay. day. So last question. When it's all said and done and you look back at your career, where do you what do you want to have accomplished and say, yo, I did X, Y, and Z at the end? Uh whether what, it happens like, or not. Like on my resume. I mean, no, just like when it's all said and done, you'd be like, yo, I was able to, to do this, this, and this. I accomplished what I came for. Like, where do you envision your career taking you to? Uh, ultimately, I was able to provide a lifestyle for my son that exceeded the lifestyle I had. I grew up a poor kid. I, I come up from I'm, I make no bones about it. I'm from the bottom. That's dope. I'm from the bottom. My father worked two full-time jobs. My mother worked. Uh, my, my father would, uh, make all, we all had to have a job at 15, all of my siblings at 15, yeah. you could get whatever you want for your birthday. When you turn 14, 15, you could get whatever you want for your birthday, but you're going to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> all of us, when we hit 15, had a job it's because that was the household I grew up in. My father was very, you know, work oriented and family oriented. So my brothers, when they were 15, before I was, when they got paid on Friday, my father would say, okay, you got paid today. Give your all of your younger siblings, $5. Yeah. So we would all get $5 from our siblings because they were working and we weren't work age yet. Okay. So I just want to create a life for Charleston. He lives comfortably and is able to take advantage of every opportunity that he has. And like I said, whatever he's into, if he want to play basketball, I'm a hundred percent into it. I will get you a shooting coach. I will get you, you know, whatever you need to help, you know, propel your game. If you want to play piano, that's my favorite instrument. If you want to play it, if you want to learn how to swim, I will get you a swimming instructor. Everything that you want to do, I'm going to make sure his, Life is, you know, way better than what his grandfather, his life was. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's ultimately the goal. In the business, I want to be able to create uh, projects that aren't necessarily for me. I want to create projects for the next me. Yeah. That he can create for the next me and the next me and the next me. I just okay. want to make sure that I, I contribute. I want to make sure that my my uh, work, when I look, when people look back on it, is a contribution to the next generation of comics. Yeah, keep it going. And the next generation of comics. So in a hundred years, when I'm not 10 years, but in a hundred years when I'm gone, there will be something that I created that is still living on that other comics uh, uh, capitalize on because I created it. Okay. So last thing, uh, I know you got something big coming up at the end of this month. Oh yeah, the, blo you the blog starts yeah. tomorrow. So why don't you tell them what it is and yes. then tell them where they can reach you at. Okay, okay. So tomorrow is March 1st. I'm going to start a blog. I'm going to do a daily blog on my Instagram just like, the, the countdown to the special March 25th. Uh, I'm taping my first live special at the long beach lab factory. Uh, I'm putting my own money up. This is, this is not management help. This is not agency help. This is me in a position where, uh, 
I haven't been getting the opportunity, the 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 the, the network deal that everybody hopes for. Yeah. I haven't been able to get it. So for whatever reason, some of the some of the fault is my own. Uh, but now 2023 is my year of not waiting on the industry anymore. I have the resources to do it. I'm taking my own money out the bank. I'm putting my own money into lighting and sound stage and the sound and production and editing. I'm doing my own special. Tony Rock live from Long Beach, March 25th, Long Beach Lab Factory. Uh, follow me on Instagram. I'll talk about it every day. The blog starts tomorrow, like I said. Uh, Instagram, uh, Tony underscore rock. Facebook, Real Tony Rock. Twitter, Real Tony Rock. I'm going to talk about it every day until the 25th. I'm going to tape it. I'm going to edit it. It'll take maybe a couple of weeks to edit and get it the way I want it to look and the way I want it to sound. And then we'll look to shop it. You know, Netflix, Hulu, uh, Amazon, that route. If not, we'll go the YouTube route. But it is 100% a Tony Rock production, all done by myself. Hey, bro, I'm super proud of you, man. I'm betting on me in 23. I'll, I'll be there. I'll change you on yes, watching sir. it, man. So, hey, listen, this is the first episode I got to have a dude that took me on the road first. This is important to me. Um, sentimental value for this first one. So, there'll be more to come, man. It's the Mike Murphy Show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks Tony Rock. Me, bro. Thanks for having me.